morning. My name is Mickey Bell, and I'd like to welcome you to Fremont Nazarene Church. We're so glad that you're here. Fremont Nazarene exists to connect people to Jesus and each other so they can take their next step of life-transforming grace. And we hope that by the end of the service, you've experienced God's grace in a personal way and that you've made a personal connection with us. Whether you're on site or online, you matter to us and we want to connect with you and help you take your next step of life transforming grace one of the ways you can help us do that is by filling out the connect card if you're on site the connect card is in your bulletin and you can drop it in the offering plates as you leave the service today if you're watching via facebook live our online host will put a link to the connect card in the chat if you're viewing through our church website please click on the connect tab following the service and you can submit an online connect card thanks again for connecting with us in worship today we're so glad you're with us it's going to be a great service let's worship together well good morning everyone that's like when your parents make you watch a really bad home video of yourself I'm not gonna lie <laughs> let's stand up and worship this morning Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah
God praise this morning.
And Lord, as our nation prepares for a transition, Lord, remind us that truly it doesn't matter because we serve your kingdom. Your kingdom, Lord. And if we could just lay down everything else and focus on your kingdom, everything would just fall into place. So Lord, remind us that we are one people, one generation that were created to, to serve you. And that's all that matters. That's all that matters, Lord. So Lord, may your will be done. May we focus on your plan for our lives. And may we just lay everything down so as the praise goes up, our walls come down. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
you're speaking to us. You're speaking to us right now, Lord. So in this moment, as we prepare to hear your word through Pastor Jeremy, may we just listen to what you are telling us to do. And may we move when you tell us to move. We place our lives in your hands, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My name is Pastor Jeremy Henderson, and I'm so glad you've joined us in worship today. We've just enjoyed a wonderful time of worshiping together, but the worship isn't stopping just because the music has. We're going to continue to worship God in a very practical and life-transforming way through our giving. You see, giving back to God is one of the ways that God's grace works in our lives and helps us become more like Jesus. And it's one of the ways that we show God that we trust Him. Your giving helps us staff our ministries and fund our ministries. It helps keep the lights on and it helps keep the heat on during these chilly months. But more than that, your giving provides us with the needed resources so that we can continue to share the life-transforming grace of God with people here in Fremont, people in Nebraska, and people all across the globe. You see, when you give, your generosity really does make a difference. Every penny helps lead to transformed lives. So I wanna take a moment and say thank you in advance for your giving. And if you've not yet considered giving on a regular basis, I want to encourage you to pray about that. And if you don't feel like you can start with a tithe, which is 10% of your income, I'd encourage you to start with a smaller percentage and see how God rewards your obedience and fills your heart with joy because that's what giving and obedience does. It fills our hearts with joy and fills our lives with purpose because we know that we're partnering with God in His kingdom mission. You know, here at Fremont Nazarene, we have multiple ways to practice generosity. If you're on site today, you can place a check in the offering plate at the end of the service as you're heading out the doors. You can also mail a check to 960 Johnson Road here in Fremont. Fremont Nazarene offers digital giving options for everyone to utilize as well. You can go to our website, www.fremontnazarene.org, and click on Give. There's also a downloadable app from the Google and Apple app stores that's called Give Plus, and it will allow you to give through your smart device. Just enter Fremont Church of the Nazarene, and you're on your way. You know, we've even got a texting number for you, 833 833- 545-0330 that you can use to text give. Regardless of how you give, we want to say thank you for your generosity because your gift is helping people experience the life transforming grace of God. God bless you and thanks. Hello everyone, Mickey Bell here again and I'd like to give you some quick announcements that are also located in your bulletin. If you're viewing online, the bulletin is located on the church Facebook page. And if you provided us your email address, it should have been emailed to you. We've returned to our normal weekly ministry schedule, and we hope that you'll connect with us sometime this week. Monday evening at 630, Celebrate Recovery is meeting on Zoom. And Tuesday evening's prayer meeting is on site here in the sanctuary at 630. Our NAS Kids and NAS Teens Ministries are back in full swing and are also meeting on site Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. As you participate in our on-site ministries, we'd like to ask you to please wear a mask for health and sake of others. Thank you. One of the steps of grace we hope you'll consider taking at Fremont Nazarene Church is becoming an official member of the church. Pastor Jeremy's next membership class will be January 31st from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. in the Shaw Ministry Center and will also be available to you via Zoom. Please let us know if you'd like to take this step of grace via your Connect card, clicking on the Connect tab on our website, or by simply emailing the church office. If you'll be participating in the class via Zoom, we need you to provide us your email address so we can send you the meeting link. 
One last announcement before we get to Pastor Jeremy's message today. Night to Shine is back, and although it may look a little different, we are still so excited to celebrate our honored guests, and we need your help. We still need help in the areas of donations and spreading the word. So please help us by getting the word out that Night to Shine is back and better than ever. God bless you all, and thanks again for connecting with us in worship today. We pray you'll experience God's amazing grace as you listen to the message. Who are viewing online, we bring greetings to you. We love you. We're glad that you're tuned in. And uh, this is our second week of a new sermon series that we're calling Life Hacks for Tough Times and Rough Relationships. And, and how many people have ever had a tough time or a rough relationship? If you've had a tough time or a rough relationship and you're watching online, type in, yeah, that's me. All of us in the room, all of us watching online, we've experienced that. And so it's my prayer that as we walk through the book of James together, we can discover some life hacks that will help us in these tough times and with rough relationships. So um, before we get going, though, I want to take a moment and just pray. So would you please just bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to bring your word. And Lord, I realize today that if anything is going to happen that, Lord, has eternal significance, it's only going to happen through the power of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray and I ask that, Lord, it would be your words that are heard and not mine, and that Jesus Christ would be lifted up and so that he can be seen and heard. Lord, we thank you that your presence is with us. Speak to us, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So it, it's an experience that uh, my wife, Zandra, and I uh, have every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, perhaps many of you here in the room have this same experience or have had it with your children or maybe with your grandchildren. Those of you watching online, you probably know what I'm talking about. It is the dreaded experience of dropping your kids off and picking your kids up from school every day. Yeah, Myra Catherine, I see that hand. Yeah, I, I see that hand. You know, now I am wonderfully blessed to have four children that I love with all my heart who go to three different schools, which means that getting them to school on time every day is more than just a little bit of an adventure, Arlen. Sometimes I feel like I'm in Mission Impossible. Bum, 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 You know, it, now, when it comes to this sort of a thing, I'm one of those parents that tries to prep my kids ahead of time, telling them that this is like storming the beaches of Normandy. Go, 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 get out, lunch, move it, move it, move it, you know? And, and that's just kind of the way I've approached it, you know? But now... This tactic, it works at the high school. Because if you've ever dropped a child off at the high school, you know that is already happening. You are meandering and wavering in and out. You're, it feels like you're dodging bullets. But at least you're making progress, right? Now, the one that just drives me crazy, though, is Johnson Crossing Academic Center. Now, Please do not leave this sermon and say, Pastor Jeremy hates Johnson Crossing. That's not what I'm saying. I love the administration. I love the teachers. I love the staff. My son Samuel's gone there the last two years. He's loved it. It's been a great experience. But Johnson Crossing, to get into that building, you have to go through a four-way stop. And is it just me? But does it feel like half of the population of Fremont does not know how to do a four-way stop? Holy cats, it's crazy. I have literally waited in line for 20 minutes at that stop sign, that four-way stop, to get my son. And, and oh, how I love waiting in lines because, you know, I got to pick up my kids and get them home so that I can get to a four o'clock appointment or get back here to the church so that I can get a project done so I'm not here till like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. So well, you can tell I, I, I'm not much of a fan of lines. Lines. 
They are a necessary part of life, right? But if we're honest, the best we can say about lines is we tolerate them, right? If you like waiting in line, please see me sometime because I need to pray for you. I, we just don't like them, right? I mean, and, and researchers have told us, they've speculated that we will spend as much as five years of our lifetime waiting in line. And of that five years, we will spend at least six months of it waiting in traffic. Aren't you feeling blessed today? Aren't you glad I shared that? I, I, I'm here to encourage you. Kelvin, I'm here to encourage you today. There you go. I know, that's what you came to church for. But, you know, one of the interesting things about lines, though, is that they actually serve as a kind of, as of a pretty powerful visual for life and living. Because, you know, if we picture life like a line, there's always people in front of us, and then there's always people behind us. And we've got all sorts of measuring tools in society from which we place people in line, right? You see, oftentimes the people with more get in front of the line and the people with less end in the back of the line. And the more and the less, they come in all sorts of forms and fashions, don't they? More or less status and influence, more or less gifting and beauty, more or less power and net worth, more or less agreeing with my preferences and opinion. And really, this, this has great impact for how we treat people and engage with others for the simple reality that life has taught us that really, more times than not, the people who are at front of the line are the ones who are valued more and get the VIP treatment. Somebody say yes. True. Yes. Yes. So what happens to the people at the back of the line? More than times than not, they're oftentimes overlooked, they're undervalued, and underappreciated, right? With the result that oftentimes the people that we feel are in the back of the line exist out of sight and out of mind. So here's the deal. Probably every single one of us here on site and every single one of us who are watching online have participated in this and not even realized it. What do you mean, Pastor Jeremy? Well, many of us have been taught a principle in life growing up that goes something like this. Your primary objective in life is to get to the front of the line because that is where success and superiority and significance and security lies. Does that sound like a familiar story? There's just one problem with this. If we hold on to this value as being of absolute importance, we risk having our character and our likeness formed into someone else other than Jesus Christ. And we can, in our actions and attitudes, actually find ourselves at odds with what is taught in the Scripture and in what Jesus says. Can somebody agree with me on that? So as followers of Jesus Christ, friends, if we treat the people in front of us as VIPs, while we treat the people behind us in line with contempt and judgment as being less important, less human, less valuable in God's sight, what we have done is we have created love with limits. Love with limits. And according to James, what we've really done is we have committed the sin of favoritism. So what I want us to do is turn our attention to James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And I want to, I hope, discover a new life hack for us today that will help us to fall into line, so to speak, with Jesus Christ's view of people and relationships. So here we are, James chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. 
If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with your evil thoughts? All right, so let me paraphrase what James has just said here. He's, he's just said, do not make an idol out of the people who are in front of you in line. Do not make an idol out of the people who are in front of you in line. I might have to say it one more time, but it needs an amen right there. You see, there's a fascinating thing that happens here in the word favoritism. In the Greek, it literally means to receive someone's face. Now, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? But I want to give you a couple of phrases that perhaps you've heard and let you try them on for size because they're actually in sync with what James is trying to say here. Try and finish this sentence with me. Don't judge a book by its cover. Or appearances can be deceiving. That's right. Now, one of the best examples of this in Scripture is actually found in the Old Testament story when God chooses David to be king, and it's found in 1 Samuel 16. Now, Samuel, he would have chosen all of David's brothers ahead of David. But the Lord had other plans because the Lord does not look at people like we do. The Lord looks at the heart. And this is what we find in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so as we read throughout the scriptures, God makes it clear he does not have the same sort of lines as we do. He doesn't view people the same way that we do. We don't find favoritism in the heart of God. And God's desire is that we as his children, as followers of Jesus Christ, would follow in line with him in this practice. I want us to consider some texts, both from the Old Testament and the New. The first is from Deuteronomy, and it says this. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. And now I want to take you to the words of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans when he says this, For God does not show favoritism. Now, this is a real bummer for the people who have bought into the mantra that I saw on a t-shirt the other day that says, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. You ever seen those out there? But seriously, though, favoritism, discrimination, partiality, these things show up in ways that we may not have considered. And typically, they show up in one of two categories, conscious or unconscious bias. Now, conscious bias is obvious. It's undisguised. It's willful. Conscious bias happens. Arlen, conscious bias happens when we say we love the Huskers, we love Big Red, and we love black shirts, but we cannot, we just cannot have anything to do with Ohio State Buckeyes or any of their stuff, right? Amen. Somebody needs to type amen on the chat on that one, right? Amen. So that's, that's conscious bias, all right? So James is, is having us kind of consider here that consciously and willfully choosing to hate or exclude or stand in judgment of someone because of the color of their skin or their age or their political party or their educational level or their economic level or the brokenness or neediness or sinfulness in their lives he is saying that is the worst kind of favoritism and he calls a spade a spade and he calls it sinful. 
Now, there may be someone here who today or maybe someone who's watching online and, and they're saying to themselves, well, Pastor Jeremy, I've not done that. I believe you. But friends, that doesn't mean that we are not all susceptible to the second category of favoritism, which is unconscious bias. And unconscious bias is much more subtle and sinister because it's, it has a lot to do with social preferences that we have as a society that lie below the conscious level. Now, let me give you an example. There was a study done about, it's been about four years ago now, but the study showed that only 3% of our population is six foot two in height and taller. So if you are six foot two or taller, man, you are above the curve, like me, obviously. I'll keep moving forward. That's obviously a, a, a joke there. So, But in that same study, did you know it was also revealed that over one-third of Fortune 500 CEOs are men who are six foot two in height or taller? Now, is this an example of deliberate prejudice against men or women of average height? I mean, are there people on search committees who are saying to themselves, well, you know, that guy, he's got all the qualifications, he's got all the education, but, you know, he's kind of a hobbit-sized guy. He's only five foot seven. Or, or that they're saying, well, you know, she's got all, the, all that it takes, but she's a woman. I, I certainly hope not. But this is just an example of how sometimes unconscious bias happens. And, and it's a dangerous thing, you see, because the dangerous thing about unconscious bias is that we often don't see it right before our eyes. We're blind to what is happening. We've been conditioned to see things for, well, this is just the way it is. And this happens in all sorts of arenas of life and in all sorts of ways in relationships. So James warns the church to, to take a look and see where there's this potential for unconscious bias to happen. And to do so, he ends up setting up this hypothetical scenario in his text. I want us to go back to James 2, beginning in verse 2 and going through verse 4. He says this, Let's suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? All right, so let me put this in today's context, all right? Let's say that... You know, it's about five minutes before the service is starting, and, and, and two men walk through uh, the door. They're both guests. And, and one is Mr. Ring on his finger, but the other guy is Mr. Ring around the collar. The one guy is Mr. Bling, but the other guy needs to go see Mr. Clean. You know what I'm talking about? And then you roll out the red carpet for the one, and then you just hope to keep the other one off of the carpet in general. How do you think James would judge that type of behavior? He'd call it for what it is. Sinful. Wrong. You see, the Christian faith and favoritism do not belong in the same sentence, much less in the church or in the lives and hearts of individual followers of Jesus. Amen? I'm going with the three of you who said amen. Amen. You see, friends, this is why we have to be intentional in our words and in our attitudes and in our attitudes toward people. You see, we have to be intentional in letting people know that no matter where they are at in the line, that they matter to God and that they matter to us. And you see, that is really the heart of the life hack I want to give us today. If you don't remember anything else about today's message other than I am not six foot two, I hope you'll remember this. Here it is. We fight favoritism by giving VIP treatment to those more vulnerable than us. We fight favoritism by giving VIP treatment to those more vulnerable than us. 
You see, what we do is, is we fight favoritism by going with Jesus to the back of a line to serve the lost and the least and the last. And really, Jesus doesn't give us an option in this regard. It, it's more like this is an authentic demonstration of our faith because our hearts have been changed by the life-transforming grace of God. You see, at some point in every person's life, we have to decide who we are and what will define our lives. Will we live to impress people and fight to get to the head of the line? Or will we choose to live for the sake of others and make an impact in the world by going to the back of the line with Jesus to serve people? Because every time we go to the back of the line, we reveal the love and the grace of Jesus at work in us, and we provide love without limits. So, Pastor, this is really great, but how do we do that? Well, I'd like to give you three practical points of application that any one of us can do on a daily basis. And the first is simply this, learn names. Learn names. Names matter. If names didn't matter, your mama and daddy wouldn't have given you one. And, and, and when Jesus called his disciples to be his followers, he called them by name. He didn't just say, hey, you. No, he, he called them by name. And, and so, friends, names matter. And, and think about how much it means to you whenever someone remembers you by your name and calls you by your name. And, and so, one of my practices that, that I like to do wherever I've been in ministry is I like to frequent the same restaurants or grocery stores and, and most especially the same Starbucks, right? So I know that's hard to believe, but I, I like to frequent those same places so that I can get to know the people who work there and, and I can start to plant seeds of kindness and grace and love in their lives and, and, and build a relationship so that I can eventually over time earn their trust and invite them to church. And, and so, you know, since we moved here in July of 2019, I've been going to the same Starbucks here in Fremont. It's probably the same one that most of you go to. It's the one on 23rd. And so, you know, I've gotten to know a lot of the baristas by name and connect with them. And, and But there was a couple of weeks ago, I, I went through the drive through lane and, and, and as I went through it, you know, I saw one of the crew members and and, and I asked them how they were doing and, you know, how's life treating you? Tell me about your family and that sort of stuff. And, and, and I was totally expecting them to, to follow up by saying, well, hi, Jeremy, how, how are you doing? And, and, and the same. But they didn't. And, and, and so I kind of scratched my head a little bit and, and was kind of thinking to myself, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like a regular here. You know, every place has got to have a norm, you know. I, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm kind of norm, you know, I'm like, and the way I take my tea is so weird that they ought to have a Jeremy button on the cash register, you know, and, and so I was just thinking to myself, man, at least they could have said, yeah, hi, Jeremy, it's good to see you today, but then my next thought was, Jeremy, you schmuck, you don't even know their name, and their name's on a name tag on their apron, you know, it's this kind of stuff that happens all the time, right? Oftentimes in life, people who are at the end of the line in our minds are the first ones to get overlooked and underappreciated, right? So for us to take a step to learn their names, call them by name, that's a big first step towards showing someone that you value them and that you think that they are a VIP, not only in God's eyes, but yours. Second thing we can do is we can listen to people's stories. I've shared with you folks many times since I've been here about my relationship with my grandma Stanley. And to this day, my grandma Stanley is the wisest person that I have ever met and had the pleasure of knowing. My grandma Stanley was an elementary school teacher before she began her family. And oftentimes I wonder if we adults need to go back to elementary school to relearn how to treat each other in life. But that's a whole other story. But I remember there was this time when I was in high school and, and my grandma had just retired and I wanted to go down and see her. And, and so I drove the 20 minutes down to Monette, Missouri. And I remember coming into the house and I sat down at the table and, 
Grandma brought some milk and cookies, and that could explain a few things here. But uh, we won't go there. But I, I remember, I don't remember exactly what the, the topic of the conversation was, but I remember that I was fussing about something. I was fussing about someone who was in a situation that in my mind proved that they were back in the back of the line and that obviously I was much superior to that person because I was in front of them in line. And then my grandma, she stopped me as she had a frequent time of doing and in her proverbial wisdom she told me, Jeremy, never judge someone till you walk a mile in their shoes. And I really feel like that's still good advice and good practice for today. You see, friends, showing love and grace and mercy to others, it can change the world. But it starts with listening. It starts with seeking first to understand and then to be understood. It starts with shutting our mouths and softening our hearts, and opening our ears. Why? So that we can listen with a desire to understand the stories of other people, so that we can walk a mile in their shoes, especially those whom, in our minds, we would normally associate them as being back behind us in line. And as we listen to people's stories, we're going to come across divergences of opinions. We are going to come across differences of perspectives. We are going to come across disagreements that we have with them about decisions that they've made in their lives. But my friends, if we will take the time to listen instead of jumping into the conversation to interrupt them, to give them a piece of our minds, then we might just discover some trauma or tragedy or tension in their lives that have shaped their worldview and impacted their decision making. You see, in the world we live in today, my friends, learning someone's name and using their name instead of a label is one of the most revolutionary kingdom practices I can think of. In today's world, listening to someone's story and remembering that the person who is speaking is a person that God believed was worthy of dying on a cross for. That is an act of Christ-like love and an offer of life-transforming grace, both for you and the one who's listening. Third thing I'd like to share with you is to provide opportunities. This is all about using our influence to provide opportunities for people who would never receive such a blessing otherwise. If you have ever received this gift of grace, you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever had somebody in your life who gave you an opportunity that you would have never had otherwise and it changed your life? Have you ever had that happen? I have. I have. You know what it's like for someone to use their influence to open a door of opportunity for you that you would have never had the chance to experience otherwise. You know how it changed and transformed your life. And today, I want to share a video with you that I came across that demonstrates just such an opportunity. And then afterwards, we're going to bring this sermon in for a landing. Let's watch this video together. I'm Phil Bowyer, and from Northeastern Indiana. Taught and coached for 34 years. Three years in Florida and mostly in Indiana, and then here in Georgia, we're in our 10th year. The thing that brought us to Georgia is probably unexplainable, unless you know who God is. We adopted Michael in 1991. Uh, Cheryl and I had already had two kids, uh, Eric and Maggie, within a year he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Michael walked for a while with leg braces and then um, had some falls. He couldn't keep his balance. And, and then he's been in a wheelchair since, uh, since he was 12. Early on in the first school year, and here's a note from Phil Bolier says, I met your son today. 
what an amazing kid, because Michael's had got this great memory and talks about cars and never forgets them. And his favorite thing to say is, love you too. That's what he, he's always done that. O'Leary writes this note and says, I'm blown away by this kid. I'd love to have him be part of our basketball program at Mill Creek. Mill Creek High School is a big high school and um, I was busy and had my list of things to do and was walking down the hall when I met Michael in the wheelchair and his buddies and we talked a little bit and uh, shook their hands and said see you all later and turned to start walking away and I hear love you too coach Bowler and I turned and went back and said like what was that and it was love you too coach Bowler and that just struck me Phil and I meet in the parking lot at Mill Creek and we just kind of share our stories. And he tells me how he wound up after being a very successful basketball coach in Indiana, coming down to Atlanta, you know, big new school, be the head basketball coach. As we were in the parking lot talking about Michael, I said, look, here's what he's all about. He's all about hanging out with people. He's all about wanting to be included with, you know, and just, you know, being part of stuff. Everything he does is with every ounce of effort he has. And Phil said, well, that's what I want my, my team to learn having a heart for others, and maximum effort. I said, well then, Michael's your guy. The game days were the most special. And he would come in and, and put on his 32, and the players would help him slide that on and get, get it right, and Ernie was around, and, and we'd get together and do our pregame and talk about some things, and we'd often talk about you know maximum effort and heart for others. That's what we wanted our mantra, our heartbeat to be. And then Michael would say that, and often when I would say it to the team, he'd repeat it. And then we would get around him and put our hands on him, and, and he'd say, one, two, three, we'd say Hawks. You know, this is, I love you, in sign language. And as soon as Phil and Michael started talking, and, and I'd say, no, yeah, Michael knows what this is, and, and this is love you too. Take the index finger and point at the other person, I love you too. So Phil starts teaching this to his kids. It was amazing on senior night, Michael's second year, they're giving out these gifts to all the players and they call them up one at a time to be recognized. And Michael's the last guy they call up. So Cheryl and I walk out to center court and Michael rolls up in his chair and they say his name. And you look up in the student section and you see all these kids standing up going like this. What Phil did basically is take one of the least of these and elevated. My wife Cheryl was like, I never thought he'd be chosen for anything. Never thought he'd be on a team. And Phil made that possible. We fight favoritism by giving VIP treatment to those more vulnerable than us. And friends, can you imagine a church that loves without limits? For that is the type of church that people will be clamoring to be a part of. Because there's nowhere else in the world where you can experience that type of love. A love that leads to a life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ because someone else has experienced his life-transforming grace through us. We fight favoritism by giving VIP treatment to those more vulnerable. Heavenly Father, I just have to ask you first and foremost to forgive me, Lord, the times in my life when I've been more about the people in front of the line that I'm trying to get ahead of than, Lord, than I've joined you in going to the back of the line to serve the least and the last and the lost. And Father, I pray that you would forgive us and we repent, Lord, for sometimes it's just unconscious bias, Lord, and we don't even realize that we're doing it. 
But I ask and pray that you would have mercy on us and forgive us and form us and shape us as a people, as a church, to be that type of group, that type of person, that type of congregation, Lord, that loves without limits, that seeks, Lord, to share the life-transforming grace your love with everyone, regardless of where they're at in line, regardless of whether they're in front of us, right beside us, or if they're behind us, Lord. Help us to be that type of people, for that is who you are. For you left the throne of heaven. Talk about being at the front of the line. And you came to us at the back of the line and you died for us you gave yourself for us and we want to say thank you and we want to be followers of yours who do the same who die to ourselves so that Lord others can experience this amazing love and life transforming grace. Father, I ask that as we consecrate ourselves to you, that you would sanctify our hearts and our minds and our lives from the inside out. And form us and shape us more and more into the image of Jesus. This morning, Lord, we consecrate these elements of your supper, a means of grace that you have given to us that nourishes us, Lord, and that you use, Lord, in ways that I just can't quite describe or understand, but I know that you do to form us and shape us more into your likeness. So, Lord, as we receive this meal, let it nourish our souls. And let it be a means of grace that helps us become more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to remind you that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples in an upper room. You know, before he took the bread, do you remember that he had stopped to wash his disciples' feet? He humbled himself. And so today, as we receive this bread, let it remind us of our servant king who went to the back of the line for us. So let us now take this and let us eat and be thankful that Christ died for us. Later in the evening, he also took the cup. And having given it to his disciples, he told them that it was the cup of the new covenant in his blood. Blood that he would shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Yours and mine. So let us now take and drink and be thankful for what Christ has done. Father, we thank you for the meal we've received. We thank you for the grace that you have demonstrated to us and given us. And Lord, we pray that by your grace, we would be transformed more and more to your image. And Lord, we love you. Help us, Lord, to be your hands and feet, your heart and your mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, I have the blessing of welcoming Pastor 
Tyler Runyon to come and share with us a couple of next steps that you might consider taking as a result of hearing a message like this. Pastor Ty. Well, good morning. I hope that you are well this morning. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel very challenged by that message this morning. My mask is stuck in my hair. Okay. Um, so as, as we do each week, we don't want to keep what we learned here in this building. But instead, we want it to internalize inside of us, and we want to live it out as we go. And so maybe today or this week, your next step is to confess, to ask God to forgive and reveal conscious and unconscious bias that you may have towards others. Maybe your next step this week is to invite a friend to church. If you don't have a friend that needs Jesus, go make some friends. Maybe start with someone that you don't know. Learn their name. Listen to their story. Be a listening ear to them. And then when the opportunity presents itself, invite them to church. Tell them about the, che the Jesus that changed your life. Maybe your next step is to give generously. Your tithe and your offering, it helps Fremont Nazarene Church. It helps our district. It helps the Nazarene Church around the world to be able to do ministry in our community, communities around the world, and to love the most vulnerable people. We have something called a shape survey. Maybe your next step is to take that this week to learn about what areas of service are compatible or something that you're passionate about. To find your place of service not only in this church, but also where you can join with Jesus in the mission that he has in the world. If you're interested in taking the SHAPE survey, you can go to our church website. And under Next Steps, if you go to Serve Others, it's actually right online. You can do it. It will email it to us. And then we can follow up with you to set up a meeting to go over your results. What I do know is that a church that loves without limits, that's the kind of church that Jesus is calling us to. So as we go today, as we take our next steps of grace, we're taking steps toward Jesus so that we can go and we can be people that love without limits. Thank you, Pastor Ty. Some very challenging next steps that can help lead to us to experience God's life-transforming grace in our lives and others as well. Well, as we dismiss the service today, I'd like to ask everybody who is here on site today to do this. If you're watching online, I want you to put your hands out like this because I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you as we dismiss. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each man, woman, and child, every teen, every young adult, every person who is here on site and those who are watching online. God, I ask and pray that you would bless them exceedingly and abundantly beyond what they could dare to ask or imagine. I ask and I pray that your life-transforming grace would work in their hearts and lives in the, this new week and that they would encounter your presence in ways that, Lord, perhaps surprise them, that they will discover you, Lord, in the most unusual of places even. And I pray and I ask, dear God, that you'll keep them healthy, that you will keep them well, that you will protect them from harm. I ask and I pray, Jesus, that you would bless them, Lord, and draw them near unto your heart. And, Lord, speak to them and give them wisdom and guidance. But most of all, Lord, I pray for all of us that you would help us to go from this place 
to be the hands and feet and the heart and the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ to everyone, regardless of where they're in line, in front of us, behind us, right beside us. Help us to follow you, Jesus, where you lead, and to share the love of God and the grace of God that can transform their lives. I pray this in your name, Lord. Amen and amen. Everybody, God bless you. Thank you so much for coming to church. Thanks for tuning in. All of our online folks, we love you. Remember, folks, you are loved and you are prayed for. God bless you. You are dismissed.